Flathub is the default place to acquire flat packs. And while it seems fairly well documented and fairly easy to go and host your own repos, most of the software still just exists on Flathub. And over the past couple of months, developers at CodeThink, in collaboration with Flathub, have been working on some pretty major changes. Now, if you're paying fairly close attention, you may have known about these changes back in January. There were a couple of articles that came out at the time, but nothing really major. What's happened now, though, is the changes have gone live over on Flathub Beta. The first thing you'll probably notice is a new site redesign. It's got a dark theme by default. I think it looks great. I didn't really dislike the old layout. I think this is fine as well. And the new one also is fine. It's got a bit less wasted space, but this is sort of the most inconsequential change of all of the changes being made. The other changes are going to change the course of Flathub going forward. If you look at the top right corner, you're going to notice a profile picture. Flathub now has a login flow and a profile system. You might be thinking, well, why does Flathub need that? Well, one of the things they want to do is add a way to verify if the app you put onto Flathub is a first party application or not. Are you the one who actually made that project or is it something like say, the Discord flat pack where someone went and took Discord and then put it onto Flathub? Neither of these things are going away, it's just a way to differentiate if something's official or if it's a third party. Right now the verification is going to be done by linking your GitHub or your GitLab with Flathub. Right now I don't have any authored apps, so having GitHub linked there isn't really doing much. If you don't want to use GitHub or GitLab, you can log in with your GNOME account. I didn't know GNOME had an account system or log in with Google. Right now, there is no regular email login, username, things like that. I don't know if they're planning to do so in the future either. The only issue is that when you have a password system, then you have to manage passwords. And I don't think I can think of a service that hasn't had a data leak at some point in the past. Avoiding that by just linking accounts is a much uh, cleaner process. And besides the peace of mind you get knowing that something like OBS, for example, is a first party app, why would you want this information? Well, the other thing they are adding is a Stripe powered payment mechanism. So this is going to support things like donating to a project. The button you see here right now isn't using that system. Instead, it's going to the regular contribute page. If you want to see this in action, on the home page for Flathub, there is a donate to Flathub. So clicking this is going to let you, use, you know, select how much you want to donate. 5, 10, 15, 20, or set whatever amount you want to go and set. Like, I don't know, 69, 69, and then make the donation. However, it is also going to support paid applications. Whether that means paid applications in the style of something like elementary, where there is a price tag attached to it. But if you want to set that price tag to zero, you are totally free to do so. Or it might mean a set price tag, like, for example, Critter over on the Windows Store, where I think it's like $10 or $15, and then you get access to the application. And it's not going to be supported at launch, but there is considerations in the future to maybe support app subscriptions. Now, I know some people are going to instantly freak out when they hear that, but keep in mind, Flathub has no say in how you want to monetize your app. It is entirely up to what the developers want to do. And only first party apps will be able to be monetized. This is why they need to verify who is and is not in this category. Because we don't want a Windows Store situation where there is 10 different versions of Audacity and 20 different versions of GIMP and none of them have anything to do with the original developer. It is just random other people trying to profit off of that project because it's a good project and people are willing to pay for it. So if anyone is going to profit off a project, it should be the developer of that project. What is unclear is how it affects monetizing forks. So I think we can all agree that a project that takes something like Critter, for example, makes no changes. Maybe it changes the name slightly. Maybe it's trying to do typo squatting where it's sitting on a slight misspelling of Critter, but it's trying to act like it is Critter, and then sticking a price tag on that isn't really a thing we should be encouraging. But then there are projects like, say, Awesome WM. Obviously, you couldn't put that on Flathub, but... You get the idea here. There are projects like Awesome WM, which are forked from DWM. 
but it's pretty fair to say that Awesome WM is different enough from DWM that it is clearly a different project. There are probably plenty of examples out there that are much, much closer. I don't think you can really deal with this on a policy level. I think when these cases do come up, it needs to be dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis. Maybe there are cases where it is different enough, or maybe it's a case like, say, OBS Titan 652, where it's base OBS with some extra plugins and not really a separate project. Now, even though FlatHub is going to be handling everything through Stripe, there is some considerations on whether they should take platform fees. If they do take them, it's not going to be much, maybe like 5 or 10%, and this is then going to be used to help fund FlatHub and make it a better and better service that more developers are going to want to use. At the absolute bare minimum, they are going to need to take the transaction fees that Stripe is charging them. Now, having a means for developers to get paid, I think is great, but it's not like CodeThink and FlatHub are just doing this purely out of the goodness of their heart. Having a payment mechanism built into your software distribution platform acts as a giant incentive to get more projects onto FlatHub. And with the release of the Steam Deck, now having this giant hardware install base, there is more and more of a reason to get your project as a flat pack and put it up onto FlatHub. We might see a point some point into the future, like five or ten years from now, where flat packs are like a really core part of the Linux desktop experience. At this point, you might be saying, well, how many people really get their software directly from the FlatHub website? And my answer to that is probably not that many. Most people use things like the Flatpak command line tool. If they want a GUI, they'll use something like KD Discover. Maybe they'll use the GNOME Software Center and things like that. And the plan is to make this payment system accessible by these applications. Now, I don't think it's going to be every single application, but GNOME does have a mock-up of how this might actually function. So let's say you want to buy the application called Workbench. So you'll go and press the button, and then you can either go and validate that purchase, or if they let you, they'll let you set what price you actually want to pay. From there, it'll try to authenticate the purchase. If the purchase goes through, purchase is complete, and then you can go and download and install the application, and from there, go and open it. And after the fact, the application is also going to be listed in the applications that you currently own. So if you were to go to a new system, you could easily go and install everything you had from that previous system. And I haven't seen a mock-up for this, but the plan is to also get this supported over on KDE as well. I also haven't seen what this means in the context of the command line application. Is the payment system only going to be there on the GUI? Or if you try to download a paid application from the command line, is it also going to prompt you for that information? I'm sure that is going to be answered as we go forward into the future, but right now it seems to still be kind of up in the air. Because if they don't have the payment system there, and it just circumvents it altogether, it seems like a really badly implemented system. Now, if you really don't like the concept of paid applications, there is some hope for you. So if an application has a price tag attached to it, it is going to exist in a separate repo from the rest of FlatHub. So if you want to install just free applications, you can use that. And if you want to install the paid applications, you can add this extra set of projects. It's unclear what this means if a project has donations available. I would hope that is still included in the rest of FlatHub, because you don't have to pay for it. It is just an option there if you'd like to support the developers. Now, I have seen some concerns over this kind of devolving into a Windows Store situation where you're forced to pay for applications that are otherwise available for free. Take Critter, for example, where on the Windows Store, they chose to have a price tag. I can understand this concern because flat hubs are convenient to use and you don't exactly want that functionality being locked behind a paywall. I would hope that most developers who want to add a price tag do it in the elementary style where you can pay as much as you want or as little as you want. If you want to pay nothing, you are free to do that. But from the developer perspective, I think it is entirely up to the developer on how they want to monetize their project. If in the case of Critter, they want to go and put a price tag on there, I think they should be able to do that because Critter isn't doing that for no reason. That is funding 
two full-time developers, but I'll leave that discussion up to you guys. From my perspective, I like good developers at least having the option to get paid if they want to go and do so. And if the users decide we don't want to pay for this, well, there are other means to acquire that application, whether it's from your distro's package manager or going directly to the source code and compiling it yourself. But let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. That's going to be it for me. So if you like this video, I'm going to go and like the video. If you really like the video and you want to become a, one of these amazing people over here, go check out my Patreon, subscribe, so don't pay link in the description down below. I've got a podcast called Tech Over T. I've got a gaming channel called Brody Robson Plays. That's going to be it for me and... I screwed up my outro.